Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. I've got us at, at, at nine o'clock. Thanks again for your for your patience. Uh, today we're going to be having uh, we're going to start a series of export finance and risk mitigation webinars. We've got one today, uh, this one here, uh, and tomorrow at the same time, nine to ten, will be the second session. And then next uh, next week on the 14th. We'll have another one, um, a one-hour webinar, just like this one, and on the 15th as well. So it's a series of four webinars pertaining to export financing and risk mitigation. Okay, just kind of some housekeeping stuff. Uh, here's some instructions in terms of if you guys need to be able to hear and just kind of setting your your computer up uh, also want to make sure that you guys if you if you have any questions or comments uh, to use the question panel down at the bottom there uh, to ask any questions and I will be relaying those questions to the, the uh, presenters so feel free to do so this uh, webinar is being presented by the Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions Department of Arkansas Economic Development Commission in conjunction with and in support of the Arkansas District Export Council. Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions, their goal is to support uh, companies by strengthening individual companies, uh, also helping them with sustainability and teaching them about leadership development to make sure that the companies are fully operational and and uh, there's a lot of people at uh, AMS that have uh, engineering backgrounds and technical backgrounds and leadership backgrounds to be able to help you to try to make sure that your company increases in value because you're doing all the right things to be able to, to be sustainable. Good morning. The Arkansas, the Arkansas uh, District Export Council, there's 60 decks uh, throughout the United States and we're charged with encouraging and supporting the export of goods and services that will strengthen individual companies, stimulate U.S. economic growth, and create jobs. So today's session, uh, this first session, will be uh, presented by the Small Business Administration and also Exim Bank. They're going to be talking about the different programs they have to be able to finance and to provide risk mitigation uh, instruments for your exports. The uh, SBA, the Small Business Development uh, uh, Administration, uh, is going to be talking today. Mr. Herb Lawrence uh, and Rick Duda are guys from the SBA that are in charge of lender relations and uh, they'll be our presenters today, as well as Mr. Eric Miller, who is the regional director for the XM Bank. Um, you will see this slide uh, later on at the end so that you can write it down or you can write it down right now or take a picture of it. The Here's our contact information for the export um, district, uh, the Arkansas District Export Council. I happen to be the chair, the current chair of the Arkansas District Export Council, and there's my contact information. Or you can contact our administrative coordinator, Ms. Heidi Quitman at this um, email address as well. And we'll present this information at, at the end just so that you guys uh, can have it in case you, you were not able to, to photograph it. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Herb Lawrence from the, from the SBA and uh, make him a presenter and we'll take it from there in just a second here. Thank you, Rick, and waiting to get, ah, there we go, show my screen. And, all right, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us. As uh, Rudy said, my name is Herb Lawrence. Uh, I am joined by uh, my colleague at the SBA, Mr. Rick Duda. Both of us are lender relations specialists, which means we work primarily with different lenders to encourage them to use our uh, SBA loan programs. And today I'm going to take about 30 minutes to talk primarily about uh, our lending program aimed at uh, exporting. 
And so, uh, you know, we understand at the Small Business Administration that uh, small businesses face a lot of challenges and as an exporter uh, or one looking at getting into exporting, uh, it's even more so, you know, as a general rule, when people are looking into getting into it, they're not sure where all the correct information is, especially on how to do the exporting. Uh, they certainly can have uh, funding issues in trying to get the working capital or other uh, use of proceeds necessary to fund that uh, because it can be a longer process. And of course, also a lot of times lacking the necessary market access for exporting. Uh, at the SBA, we work with a number of resource partners such as uh, the DEC, uh, such as Rudy, uh, XM Bank. We also work with the Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development Center Network. Uh, who have counselors who can do free consulting to small businesses, uh, especially in export related issues. So free, strictly confidential. Uh, if you'd like more information on that, I can certainly provide that. But what we're gonna look at primarily today is that capital issue. Uh, basically with the SBA and our Office of International Trade, uh, we have really three mandates uh, that we work with. One is a state trade expansion program called STEP, S-T-E-P. And through the STEP program, you can, as a small business exporter, uh, can actually receive matching funds to help you in uh, export assistance issues. So maybe you've got a uh, opportunity to go to a trade conference in Munich, uh, but you need money to help you get there, the motel, the hotel, the other things that might be there. Uh, the SBA through our STEP program can actually help you with those expenses. We're not gonna do 100%, but we can do matching. So. Uh, and we have more information about how you can find out about the STEP program at the end of this presentation. Uh, obviously, a lot of our work is to also help uh, in your understanding the global market and how to access it. Uh, but what we're mainly looking at today, again, is this idea of international trade finance. What's there? What can we do? Now, understand that uh, as far as the SBA, the Small Business Administration is concerned, don't call me about needing your money. The, the SBA cannot, does not do direct loans. We only do what are called guarantee loans. So it's much like uh, a VA home loan, FSA, a student loan. A bank or a credit union actually makes the loan to the small business. And then the SBA can provide a guarantee uh, to that lender to help mitigate the risk that they're going to be facing uh, and then make them more interested in doing the deal with you. So, uh, you know, as far as what can we use uh, money for on our export finance work, uh, training, uh, obviously uh, we can do revolving lines of credit, we can do working capital, we can do term financing. So if you needed to, uh, add some more plant uh, or equipment uh, to expand your operations, aim primarily at exporting, and we can provide funding for that. Uh, in certain cases, if you've already got some debt, we can do that as we can help on refinancing. And then one thing that makes the exporting portion uh, different uh, from our standard uh, guarantee loan program is we can also help in the funding of standby letters of credit. So uh, a lot of things that we can do to help you. And let's just get, I'm gonna skip this slide, probably pretty hard to read, but if you're gonna all receive this uh, PowerPoint, uh, this just basically breaks out the three different export loan programs that the SBA has and just tell us like maximum amount of money, the guarantees, use of proceeds, et cetera. I'm gonna cover that in a little more detail though, individually right here. Uh, so in our normal guarantee loan program, so if a small business goes to a friendly first commercial neighborhood bank and needs money for 
uh, you know, starting a retail store downtown, a restaurant, whatever it may be, but it's domestic. Typically, the SBA provides that lender with a 85% guarantee for loans that are 150,000 or less and a 75% guarantee for loans that are over 150,000, but up to our maximum size of 5 million. However, we understand that lenders tend to get leery about the idea of funding exporting related uh, opportunities. Uh, because let's face it, your customer's not in the border. Uh, how long will it take for you to get paid? You know, a lot of things that concern the that would concern the lender. So one way that we help mitigate that with our export programs is we provide that lender with a 90% guarantee. That means that should a lender make a loan to an export uh, business, and subsequently that business goes out of, you know, goes belly up. And so the bank or credit union is in a position to take a loss. Uh, we will actually cover 90% of that loss. So they're only risking 10%. That mitigation makes a lender much more interested in looking at your loan uh, and working with you on that. So I think the most critical part about what we offer for our export uh, small businesses to help them get funding is we can give that bank or credit union up to 90% guarantee. So they're mitigating their risk uh, tremendously. They're much more available uh, or open to then looking at that uh, opportunity to make a loan to you. A few of the things that our export program does that will help you as the exporter is obviously we can provide increased access to working capital. You know, let's face it, a lot of times what we need is the green stuff in our checking accounts to help cover our expenses while we're waiting on the customer, uh, the, you know, the invoice to go from accounts receivable to green stuff in our checking account. Uh, and being able to stay liquid during that time frame, especially in exporting, uh, you know, can be a challenge. Well, our programs can provide that working capital that you need to stay afloat while you're waiting. Uh, we allow the money to go for help you work on getting into new markets. Uh, and, you know, basically what we're doing for you is also uh, giving you very competitive terms with that bank. Uh, typically, uh, we we'll, we are able to allow the bank to uh, do terms, maximum terms that are much longer than what they would normally do in-house. And that becomes critical because that's a cash flow issue for you as well uh, by keeping the monthly debt service that you would have significantly smaller. Uh, which means there's more cash for you to stay operational. So let's talk about the three programs. Uh, the first one is called our International Trade Loan Program or ITL. Now, this, any bank, any credit union in Arkansas can do an international trade loan uh, for you. They do not have to apply with the SBA to ask permission to be an ITL lender. They all have it. If they've got an agreement with the SBA to do normal SBA loans, they've got uh, the ability to do our international trade loans. And this will go up to $5 million. And it's really aimed primarily at helping with uh, fixed debt. Uh, you need to add more equipment to help manufacture whatever it is you're making that you're gonna ship to wherever. Uh, possibly to do some term refinancing permanent working capital, uh, in other words, not a revolver. Uh, and you may even, you know, you could even use it for real estate if you need it. So your current plant needs to expand operations to be able to, to produce for that uh, exporting. Uh, this program will allow for that, basically any term loan. Uh, and if the use of proceeds is uh, primarily for real estate, we can allow it to go out a maximum of 25 years. If it's primarily for equipment or uh, 
FF&E or working capital, we can actually take it out 10 years. So again, that monthly debt service that you would be doing to the bank becomes extremely less. And as long as a loan is under 15 years, we do not allow the bank or the credit union to charge any prepayment penalties. So, uh, that helps you as well. Uh, and again, what makes this so uh, advantageous is that the bank knows it's going to get a 90% guarantee to help mitigate that risk. And if your bank or credit union is a preferred lending partner, uh, which means they don't have to ask SBA to do the loan. They tell us that they're doing the loan. Uh, it can move much quicker as well. International trade loan, primarily for fixed assets uh, that you will need to expand your operations uh, as well. The other one, the second one is called our Export Working Capital Program or EWCP. Now this is strictly for revolving working capital. So uh, you need to be able to, on a regular basis, have access to working capital to keep the operations afloat while you're getting things ready to ship, while you're waiting on your customer overseas to get around to paying you, uh, to keep liquid. Uh, this is a great program because we can also go up to $5 million. So the larger working, the larger exporters may need uh, a large amount of money uh, in that working capital that can scare a lender. Uh, but again, uh, because we're going to give that lender a 90% guarantee, uh, it tends to mitigate that risk. Uh, also, using our working capital, uh, export working capital program, we may do uh, letters of credit, standby letters of credit. Uh, as well. And the other is that we, that working capital can advance on between 75 and 90% on export sales, depending on what your existing export sales are. And while there is a fee, it's only one quarter percent. You cannot beat that. And that's just tied into the loan itself. Usually the on our export working capital program, unlike our ITL that can go out 25 or 10 years, typically these uh, w uh, EWCP loans are for one year at a time. However, we can uh, renew that on an annual basis. In fact, many times that we do, and we do not give any discretion to the bank as far as interest rates or fees. And then finally, the third type, we have a number of lenders here in Arkansas who are delegated lenders. That means they don't have to send a package to the SBA to ask us to review and to make a eligibility determination. They make their own. Many of them are, and so those that are delegated lenders have something available to them called the Export Express Loan Program. So, this program allows a lender to actually review it in-house, make a decision and issue you uh, that loan without having to take time to go through the SBA for approval. Uh, it maxes out at $500,000 uh, delegated decision. As long as your amount is $350,000 or less, we'll give that lender a 90% guarantee. If it's $350,000 and one penny, up to that max of 500,000, we give them a 75% guarantee. But the good news is that lender uses all their own underwriting uh, process and collateral standards, and they make the decision uh, on their own. Uh, and also on that Export Express, uh, as far as use of proceeds, it can be uh, fixed assets. So maybe you need to buy some more equipment. Maybe you need uh, to uh, some kind of uh, or certain refinance, uh, market development uh, involved, or it can be working capital work. I mean, a revolving line of credit, or it could be both. So since you could go up to 500,000, we could do 250,000 on a term loan, 
with the bank and 250,000 as a revolving line of credit. So uh, it's a, a great program and allows the bank to move very quickly. Uh, once they reviewed your packet, they make the decision, they do the underwriting, and then they just tell the SBA, hey, thanks guys, y'all just made a uh, Export Express loan for us. So a uh, great program. Now, not all banks or credit unions in Arkansas have access to the Export Express program. They must be already a delegated lender with the SBA. Uh, and while I cannot list those on this, if you contact myself or Mr. Rick Duda at our office, uh, we can tell you those banks that are in Arkansas that are Export Express authorized. Uh, and we'll have our contact information at the very end. And so as far as the economic, now remember I said on the international trade, ITL, which is a fixed asset loan, any bank or credit union can do that uh, automatically. They don't have to get special permission. Uh, on our express program, they must already be a uh, express lender and they do apply, but we usually grant that immediately. However, on that $5 million for the export working capital program, a bank or a credit union must apply uh, to become a EWCP. And it is done very quickly, uh, primarily through uh, our folks at the uh, US uh, EAC, and we can go through that with you as well. If you need, uh, we process those through our guarantee processing center. Yeah. Now, and that for is, those of you who do not know what the USAC is, that's the U.S. Export Assistance Center, which is part of Commerce. No, no thank you, Rudy. And just uh, that's really toward the end. I know I've only got 30 minutes uh, because I do this training with many lenders to talk about. Uh, the export program. I've got links here uh, to different sources. As far as the STEP program goes, that, that matching grant, if you contact the World Trade Center uh, here in Arkansas, they will help with that program. And I've got, uh, as far as the uh, assistance in consulting, uh, our Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development Center resource partners uh, are in all the counties. They have their seven major universities here in the state. And again, they provide free confidential consulting, market research, business plans, help with loan packaging, uh, all at no charge to you. So uh, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to see what they can do to be of assistance if you need to know how to contact the uh, center that is nearest to you, uh, just contact either Rick or myself and we will certainly pass that on. And then if there are any questions uh, that you may have, uh, you can contact uh, either Rick or myself. I see we didn't put our phone numbers on there. Uh, the phone number there at the office is area code 501-324- 7379. Again, that's 501-324-7379. And uh, Rudy, I think that I made it in that 30-minute time frame. Are there well, I any questions that anybody has? At, at this time, it does not appear that there are any questions, but if, if you guys have a, a question out there, please feel free to submit them at the, in the questions section there, and I will uh, address them and forth them to, to Herb. Yeah. Uh, we're and, going to, go ahead. Well, go ahead. No, I was just going to say and something for y'all to remember, uh, because you're the small business exporter. Uh, again, it has to go through a bank. Uh, and so part of the process is sometimes, especially if you're in a rural area and are working with rural banks, uh, you know, they may not be aware of this program. So sometimes it's up to you to uh, educate them. Uh, and certainly uh, we at the SB SBA are always happy to reach out to a lender who has questions about the program uh, to explain it to them. Cause let's face it, if uh, you, know, you may know more now about the SBA's uh, export loan program uh, than some of our lenders do out there. So we're always happy to do that process. 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Herb. You're so welcome. We're, uh, next up is going to be Mr. Eric Miller with the uh, XM Bank, and uh, Eric is the Regional Director for XM, and he will be coming on here shortly. And uh, Eric, when you have a chance, go ahead and yep, there you go. Just all right. And you see and the Herb, presentation, okay? Yes, we can. And, and Herb, when you have a chance, go ahead and X out. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rudy and Heidi and the Arkansas District Export Council for the invitation to participate. I am super excited to be here. Um, just a, a quick clarification on our agency name. It is Export Import Bank but it's a little bit of a misnomer. We do not support imports and we're not really a bank. Uh, we have export finance products to help US companies put US made products and services into the hands of foreign buyers. And if you're not exporting or you're thinking about exporting, I'd like to give a compelling reason to consider it. And that's if we take the whole world <clears throat> as a pie, and cut out the U.S. piece, the U.S. piece of buying power, globally speaking, is only 5%. So and I think that number has actually crept up to 96% um, and 4% in the U.S. as of recent. So in other words, the majority of customers are outside the borders of the United States. 95 to 96% of your customers are outside the borders of the United States. And I think that is a very, very compelling statistic. Um, you know, there's a there's a competitiveness in the U.S. over who gets the customer, who's the most competitive on price and quality and delivery, and everybody's forgetting about the blue ocean outside the borders of the United States. A question that I get asked uh, occasionally is, why is the government involved in export finance? And here's a good reason why. So we take the export value of our country and put it over the GDP value of our country, we're ranked 144 out of roughly 200 countries. And if you don't recognize those flags, that's Rwanda on the left and Haiti on the right. So we're not doing a very good job of exporting. I think our trade def deficit last year was between six and $700 billion, which means we're taking way more things into this country as opposed to sending them out. And, you know, um, Eric, one of the things that's, that uh, this indicates also, and that sometimes people kind of miss out on, is that the, the way that wealth is created, it's not by having someone in Kansas beat some guy in Missouri. It's by bringing wealth outside of the United States into the United States. That how, is how wealth is created. The other way around, the Kansas, Missouri, we're just switching money from one pocket into the other. There's no wealth being created. So exporting That's a great is incredibly point. important. Great point, Rudy. That's right. If we're just circulating the same dollar from one hand to the next inside of the country, we're not we're not adding anything, right? But if we bring outside dollars into this country, then we're actually adding something. Um, one of the most common responses that we get as to why aren't more companies in the U.S. putting their products or services in the hands of foreign buyers? The most common response that we get is fear right fear fear of the unknown uh if i'm if i'm in arkansas and i'm I'm, a, I'm in little rock arkansas and i'm a manufacturer of centrifugal pumps and i'm doing just fine selling in my home state what's the incentive to go outside uh to sell to somebody in columbia you know how am i how am i going to find the buyer and if i do find the buyer how am i going to get paid what if they say they want terms? If 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 I sell to uh, you know a, a company in Arkansas and they don't pay me, I have legal recourse. I go in Colombia and I'm dealing with a different currency, I'm dealing with a different political environment, a different legal environment, a different culture, a different language, and the list goes on and on and on, right? So it's fear, it's fear of the unknown. So as the federal government, we want to get involved and help U.S. companies take that fear away. And we'll talk about those products in just a second. So our background, as far as the agenda today, give you a little background on who we are, what we do, and specifically how we can help you with the products that we offer. Um, the About Us, we're in what's called an export credit agency or an ECA because we love acronyms in the government. Um, 
basically every developed country in the world has the equivalent of us. There's 115 of us, I think was the last count in roughly 200 countries in the world. So as a country becomes more mature and more developed, they create export credit agencies because we all have the same goal, whether it's us or the export credit agency of Canada, our goals are the same and that we want to create jobs through exports. We want to help the trade deficit. We want to help U.S. companies put their products and services into the hands of foreign buyers and create money. And those money will create jobs. So we help with that. Uh, we're independent, which basically means we're not inside a cabinet. We have um, uh, political appointees as it relates to our board of directors and chairmen uh, who have a, a direct link with the um, current administration. So our last chairman, who was Chairman Kim Reed, uh, excellent uh, chairman, did, did great work for the agency. She has left under, under the Trump administration, and now we're waiting for the new political appointee uh, to be appointed as chairman of the bank under the Biden-Harris administration. We're 87 years old. Uh, we're a sunset agency. What that means is basically every so many years we get reviewed by Congress and renewed. And basically the review process is just kind of to determine uh, what we can do under the current environment. Do we need to focus on different countries, different industries? Um, some of the hot topics nowadays are 5G technology um, and, and how we can help the U.S. export more of that or, or, or create jobs through that process. We're headquartered in D.C. We have 12 regional centers. I'm in the Houston Regional Center. I basically cover uh, Texas and New Mexico. I'm on the call today for Arkansas because my uh, prior colleague has just retired who covered Arkansas. So I'm kind of filling in that gap until we get a full-time hire to cover Arkansas. Um, if you're if you're in Arkansas, um, I'm, I'm happy to help you. If your head, so our regional centers go by the headquarters of the company. So if you've got a uh, a branch in Arkansas, but you're headquartered in uh, Ohio, we would get you over to the regional director that covers Ohio. So we go by headquarters. Here's our centers. Again, I'm in the Houston, uh, the Dallas, uh, the North Texas uh, office. My colleague, Mr. Kelly Kemp, who covered Arkansas, again, he retired. So he he was in that Dallas office. Um, I'm not sure what the future looks like, whether that same office will be available for Arkansas or if it'll be closer to Arkansas, but we'll see. Here's some of the competition of export credit agencies. So again, we're the official one of the United States. Um, you know, you go over to uh, the right over there, Korea XM Bank is for South Korea and, and so on and so forth. You can kind of take a look at um, the different agencies that represent their countries again, all having the same goal, ex to take the, the nation's product that, that we represent and put it into the hands of foreign buyers. So enough about Exum, how can we help you? Let's get to the bottom line. There's really three products. We, we can insure your export credit, I'm sorry, export credit sales. We can provide access to export working capital and offer term loans to your foreign buyers. We'll do a deeper dive in each one of those. Um, the insurance, let's go back to the reason why people don't export, fear. So you're doing well here in Arkansas, you're building centrifugal pumps, um, no real reason to look outside the borders, but then you decide, hey, I need to grow this company and I need to do something different. And let's say you go to a trade show, you're putting your products on display, a buyer walks by from South Africa, loves what you do, and wants to be your distributor or customer and says, I've got customers lined up, you know, that could buy this stuff if it was in my country. But the problem is, you know, we don't have a relationship, but if you can send some products on terms, I could get these sold immediately to these, these buyers that I know in South Africa. You know, that's a lot of risk, right? So if you're a small company and you load up a bunch of pumps in a 40 foot container and say, Hey, wave your hand and say, pay me 90 days later. Not many U.S. companies really want to take that risk. But but at some point, in order to compete, you can't always tell your buyers, give me cash now, I'll send your stuff later, right? So if you're the seller and I'm the buyer, 
who's to say that you're going to send it, right? If I wire transfer you half a million dollars and hope that you're going to send my stuff, that's a risk that I'm taking. So from the buyer standpoint, there's a risk. From the seller standpoint, there's a risk of sending it uh, and not getting paid. We want to intermediate. Um, so we want to be the intermediary. So we want to ensure your your credit sales. So in other words, if you tell your buyer, pay me 90 days later, we can ensure that credit sale. We have to do a little bit of underwriting, but if, if it's a good company in South Africa or Columbia or wherever, we can look at protecting that payment for you. In other words, we give you an insurance policy as a company here in the US and protect you from non-payment. So you ship a half a million dollars of product in a 40 foot container, tell your buyer in South Africa, pay me 90 days later, we protect that payment. If they don't pay you, you put a claim into us and we give you either 90 or 95% of what's due to you, right? So we're insurance on a foreign receivable. Um, the, the obvious uh, aspect of that product is risk protection. And there's really three aspects as, as outlined here on the, on the slide. We protect it against non-payment. It's a sales tool. So I, I speak to exporters. I, I could tell you probably weekly where they say, hey, uh, I really wish I knew this product existed in the past because I'm telling buyers in foreign countries no on credit terms. But I could have said yes if I know the, the federal government, XM Bank, was going to back me up on that payment. Um, so it's a sales tool. It, it enables you to have access to more sales. And I could tell you, as one of many export credit agencies in this, in this world, um, China is probably the most aggressive. So China will tell their, their, their companies in, in, in China, um, you know, go out there, go out there and sell, 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 and we'll back you up on those payments. Um, we're, we're a small agency of about 500 employees. The equivalent of us in China, there's probably half a dozen agencies. We're one in the United States. They probably have a half a dozen in China with 15,000 employees. They're very aggressive and they want to, they want to get their exports up. So the reason why I'm saying that is when you're competing with a buyer in Colombia, wherever, and the Chinese supplier says, hey, I'll give you whatever you want, pay me 90 days later. And then they come for a comparable quote in the US and the US company generally says, mm, I don't like terms, you know, pay me now or give me a letter of credit, I'm not gonna send this stuff out. You have competition. And, it, and, and in order to have access to some of these opportunities at some point, you're gonna have to offer terms to your buyers. And we wanna be able to back you up on that and provide payment assurance. Um, the third aspect is financing. So let's say you're uh, a good sized company and you've got a million, $2 million in foreign receivables tied up. You walk over to your bank and say, you know, I'm a good company, I got a good balance sheet, got a good income statement. The problem is I need to make payroll and all my, my receivables are tied up in 10 different countries. Banks don't like export finance here. So um, if we insure it, if we, we're insuring your foreign payments, then the bank says, okay, you know, well, the federal government has your back on these payments, they're insured. Now we could talk about financing some of these receivables so you can uh, have access to cash flow to make whatever payments you need to make, whether it's payroll, whatever. So how does the process work? It's, it's a very you know, simple, straightforward process. So we have four different policies. You pick a policy that fits you best. Uh, once you have a policy in place and you offer credit to your buyers, um, there's a contract in place. You fulfill the contract. You go in our online system and pay the insurance premium for the, the insurance on the foreign payment. Um, you report the shipment. You pay the premium. If, they, if your buyer doesn't pay, you file a claim. This is just like any other insurance policy, just like auto, just like home. You're paying a, you're, you know, you you have a policy in case something goes wrong. If something goes wrong, you file a claim. So the two buckets of risk that we cover on the insurance is commercial and political. So commercial is going to be insolvency, bankruptcy, protracted default, which is a fancy way of saying more than 90 days past due. 
So let's say you're selling, and that's a key phrase there. So let's say you're, let's go back to you're building pumps. You got a buyer in Columbia. You ship $200,000 of pumps in a container and say, pay me 90 days later. If they don't pay on the due date, you're knocking on day 90 saying, hey, where's my money? No email, you get voicemail. If you don't get paid on the due date, we want you to try to collect for 90 days after the due date. And the reason for that is simple. That's the wait period, 90 days before you can file a claim. The reason for that is we don't want to be a source for slow payment, right? This is really about non-payment. So try to collect. You can't you can't collect um, and you've been trying for 90 days plus. Go ahead and file a claim under the protracted default. So that's all commercial risk. On the political side, it's going to be things like currency and convertibility, uh, war, uh, cancellation of import licenses. So let's say um, you go, same example, 40 foot container full of centrifugal pumps going to Colombia. Meanwhile, uh, the leaders of our country and the leaders of their country are disputing over some kind of trade agreement and says, you know what? And then the Colombian leader says, you know what? I'm pulling all import licenses for pumps. That's a big import of ours in this country. I'm pulling it no more. And meanwhile, you got your stuff on a vessel going there. That's a political risk problem. Not, not you know, super common, but it, it's still a risk. Most exporters sign up for the commercial reasons. What it doesn't cover, so typically it's, it's easier to describe what it doesn't cover versus what it does cover. What it doesn't cover is contract dispute. So same example, centrifugal pumps. It's a 100 horsepower centrifugal pump, multiple. You got a distributor in Columbia. You put them in a container, say, pay me 90 days later. They get to Columbia. They open up the container, and they're 25 horsepower pumps. No, not what they ordered. That's a contractual dispute. So make sure that you protect yourself uh, on either this side or that side, basically saying they got, they got what they ordered rather than there's a contractual dispute. So any contractual dispute has to be settled before a claim can be filed. That's not the reason for the insurance. The reason for the insurance is you're selling to an unknown buyer and you're worried about getting paid. Here's some of our different policies for the insurance. So if you're relatively new to exporting uh, and you have 10 or, few, 10 or fewer buyers, uh, the best entry policy for insurance is going to be the bottom green one that says express. So you can actually pick and choose up to 10 foreign buyers to add to your policy. So in other words, you can cherry pick. If you've got 20 buyers spread over 15 different countries, but you're only worried about three of them, you can do that under the express policy. You can pick and choose which ones you want to add to the policy. Um, if you have just one buyer and you don't foresee another export sale on credit anytime in the near future, you can look at the single buyer on the right, uh, which is orange. If you're a larger company and um, you know you got two, three, four million dollars in export credit sales, um, you're not new to exporting on credit. You're very comfortable with it. We'd put you in one of the standard multi-buyer on the on the on the left blue there. Now. Um, there's a differentiation between what we do and what the private sector does. The private sector offers credit insurance, export credit insurance. They offer domestic credit insurance. We as a government agency cannot compete with them. So what we do is we basically pick up the gaps that they leave behind. And there's really uh, a couple primary areas that they leave behind. One is the small and medium size, uh, roughly speaking, medium size export company um, that has you know probably less than three million in export credit sales when it starts to getting above that you probably are going to be better served in the private sector and I, i'd be happy to give you uh, a referral over there i think rudy even mentioned that one of the webinar series there's going to be somebody from the private sector speaking on their insurance policies as well uh, so if you're you're a bigger size company and you have more export credit sales you probably want to listen on to that and, and see where you're going to be fit best. But typically the small uh, exporter and also the higher risk country. So what we see often also is there's a good sized company with export credit sales and they're getting a primary policy in the private sector, but they supplement with us. In other words, let's say they've got a $5 million 
policy in the private sector and they uh, the private sector is telling them hey i don't i don't want your export credit sales in in um, west africa i don't want them in north africa and i don't want them in argentina so sometimes we'll have those exporters submit single buyer policies for each one of those companies and supplement what the private does not want because we can be uh, a second set of eyes to see if we can get our heads around the risk and ensure what they don't want. Again, picking up what they don't leave behind, picking up what they do leave behind, sorry. So pricing, how much do we charge to ensure your export credit sales? So most exporters are selling to a private sector foreign buyer rather than a government or working with a bank. So that column on the right there private means private sector foreign buyer and as you go down the pricing that's for the terms you give to your foreign buyer so let's say you're giving 60-day terms to a buyer in mexico okay um for fifty thousand dollars a product you're going to pay us 275 dollars or 0.55 percent because it's 60-day credit it's a private sector buyer in Mexico. You're going to pay 0.55% on the 50,000 or $275. So you pay us $275 to insure 95% of the 50,000. And I'll say that again $50,000 of product going to Mexico on 60 day credit. You pay us 0.55 or $275 to insure 95% of the 50,000. So Mexico buyer doesn't pay on due date, you try to collect for 90 days after the due date. If not, you file a claim and you get 95% of the 50,000, which amounts to 47,500. So you pay us $275 to basically sleep at night. Um, some of the eligibility as far as checklist, need to be in business three years. If you're, you know, if you're edging that, you're at two and a half, let's talk. Um, and that's operationally. So if your business was name was registered 10 years ago, but you just started making money last week, we're going to create or I mean, we're going to um, uh, use the last week as the start date. You need a DUNS number. Um, if you're not familiar with DMV and you need a DUNS number and you meet all the other criteria, get with me. I can give you a process to get a free DUNS number because you're doing business with the government. And the last point is near and dear to our heart, because again, we're here to create jobs in the US. So whatever we support on the insurance, it has to exceed 50% US content on your cost. So you're selling a pump that, uh, you're selling it for $10,000, but it costs you five. We're gonna look at the five and say greater than 50% of the 5,000 needs to be US content, because we wanna create jobs here in the US again. Okay, so working capital guarantee. Um, this is very similar to the SBA. So we basically um, work with a lender, just like the SBA, we're a guarantor. We're not the we're not the we're not we're not the money provider, we're not the lender, uh, we're the guarantor. So the problem, let's start with a problem here in the in our country. The problem is if you get a purchase order. Again, Columbia as, as, as an example, you get a, a million dollar purchase order, great company in Columbia. You need to make this product. You walk over to your bank and say, you know, multinational company in Columbia, publicly traded maybe even, great balance sheet and income statement. They gave me a purchase order uh, for a million dollars. I need a half a million dollars to make this stuff, to fulfill the order. When you start talking Columbia, regardless of the size of the buyer, banks here in the U.S. don't like it. So Again, government filling in gaps, the private sector. We work with your lender as essentially a co-signer. We're a guarantor of our payment. So we, we open up access to export working capital, not domestic working capital, export working capital. So you can use that line of credit to fulfill export orders. We're, our, our product is very similar to the SBA um, to guide you on who, who to use. Uh, SBA stops at $5 million. We go above $5 million. So if your needs are greater than $5 million for working capital, typically we're going to be the best fit because the SBA stops at that. It also depends on your lender. If your incumbent lender is 
um, somewhere in Arkansas and they're only familiar with SBA, not XM, then SBA and vice versa. You deal with another lender that's only familiar with XM versus that. So it's up to your lender and it's up to the size of loan that you need. Again, we go past 5 million, SBA stops there. Um, it could be used to issue standby letters of credit or performance bonds. So let's say um, you're bidding on a good size order, let's call it a million dollars in a foreign country, Paraguay, and the buyer says, um, in order to kind of weed out bidders, we want to see uh, a bond issued, uh, a bid bond, or performance bond if we give you a purchase order or a standby letter of credit. If you go over to your bank and say, I need you to send a standby letter of credit or performance bond or bid bond to my foreign buyer in Uruguay for a million dollars, your bank will say, great, put a million dollars in your account, I'll escrow it, and I'll block that money to issue the standby letter of credit. So it's not very helpful for your cash, your cash flow. So when you have an XM or SBA line of credit set up, you can use that line of credit, borrowed funds, to issue the, the, the bonds or letters of credit as opposed to using your precious cash. So it's, 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 a, it's helpful to know that as you, as you go down that path. All right, so we talked about insurance. We talked about working capital guarantee. The third solution that we offer is foreign buyer finance. This is typically capital equipment sales. So let's say you're a distributor of yellow iron, Caterpillar equipment. You got a buyer in Egypt with a great balance sheet and income statement. And they say, you know, I love your, your, your invoice. I love the equipment that you're selling. The spec is perfect. But the problem is it costs $2 million. And when I walk over to my bank in Egypt, I'm getting a term sheet of 25% a year. It's too costly to borrow here. Um, and, and if my profit margins are 20%, um, you know, I'm paying the bank so I can get a deal done. It doesn't make sense. So in situations like that, when you've got a good, credible foreign buyer, we can look at being a loan guarantor uh, to a bank. Let's call it a bank here in the U.S. Let's call it Citibank. Citibank gives a loan, if, if, if it's a good, credible buyer to, uh, in Egypt, gives a loan to your Egyptian buyer to buy your Caterpillar equipment. So we basically get involved as a loan guarantor to a lender who gives a loan to a foreign buyer, a three to seven year term loan to a foreign buyer to buy your capital goods. So keep that in mind as a sales tool as you compete globally, knowing that if you got a good buyer, we can potentially finance them. Yeah. Eric, uh, I want to highlight something because it may be kind of a, a foreign idea to, to, to some people, and that is that the interest rates in many countries are significantly higher than they are in the United States. You know, we, we complain about a 6% loan, but in some countries it's 35, 40%. Um, and so that's why this company in Egypt, just as an example, I mean, they're, they're being charged 25%. What a competitive advantage it would be if all they had to pay was 6 7% uh, or, or some, some number significantly lower than what they could get out of Egypt. I mean, that provides American companies a tremendous competitive advantage. They want to buy the, your, your widget, whatever it is, but we're uh, inducing them to buy by providing them an interest rate that is significantly lower than what they can get in the United States. Uh, I mean, sorry, in, in their country. And so do, um, as, as Eric says, this is just a tremendous tool. Do please keep that in mind. That's an excellent point, Rudy. Um, I can tell you, I was a prior exporter of capital equipment and a part owner in a, in a company before I joined XM Bank. And we exported capital machinery all over the world, but we had a, a good stronghold in sub-Saharan Africa. And I sold term sheets in West Africa for 30% a year. So, you know, think about this as a two-pronged sales approach, as, as Rudy pointed out. The first prong being what your product and services uh, and competing globally. Here's, here, here, you know, here's what I can offer you. If I'm selling yellow iron, here's what I can do on the equipment. Um, and also, you know, 
maybe I'm 5% more on the equipment versus the Chinese on what they can make, but I can save you 10% on getting a loan in the US versus what you can get in West Africa. So if, if you're selling equipment and money, you know, that that's probably going to open a lot more doors. And I know it did for me personally. I used XM Bank for 10 years to grow a small business. Um, it, we were oil and gas related. So when the oil, you know, fell out, uh, so did capital equipment purchases. Um, but as oil is picking up again, um, you know, that, that looks a whole lot different now. So think, think about that as, as Rudy mentioned that not only selling the product, but, you know, coupling that with the finance at a single digit government backed U.S. loan. That's going to sound very attractive to foreign buyers. Argentina, I think the, I've seen term sheets at 35 percent a year, um, uh, you know, and that's not unheard of in a lot of these developing countries. So now the buyer does have to meet financial ratios. I'm not I'm not I don't want to oversell this product. It's not available for anyone in any company. Um, they have to be a credible borrower credible company um, and need to pass various financial ratios. If you find a buyer that's interested in getting finance, usually step one is to send me the last three years of their audited financial statements. And we could take a quick peek and see if it's going to be doable or not. And if it's going to be doable, then we find a lender that has interest for that industry and that geography. Um, we do have restrictions. So anything we support, typically we don't do military defense related, and that's products or buyers. There's exceptions. I think some of the exceptions are dual use, drug interdiction, and humanitarian. I'll be candid with you and telling you those are far and few in between. Uh, it's an uphill battle trying to get those approved. So um, I, I got a call a couple of weeks ago. Somebody's trying to sell refurbished Black Hawk helico helicopters to a, a foreign government entity. You know, probably probably not going to look at that. Um, Content needs to exceed 50%. Yeah, again, creating jobs in here. We have on our website what's called a country limitation schedule. Um, so if you go to xmexim.gov, gov, xm.gov, and you search for country limitation schedule, you're going to get a web page that pops up that shows basically all countries we're open in and those that we're closed in. We're open in roughly 180 out of 200 countries. Um, so if you if you choose a country that you're interested in selling to and there's there's some notes on that country uh, and, and you're not clear on what that means, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to clarify that. Erica, we've got about one minute left on, on your Good, end. I'm done. Yeah, perfect. There's my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out. Uh, mobile is usually the best way to get a hold of me or shoot me an email. Happy to answer any questions or, or have any follow-ups. Thanks again, Rudy. Thank you very much. Hang on a second. I think we have a question. All right. We do have a question here. Um, here's the question. How do the XM Bank programs work in conjunction with countries with currency control that require the use of a letter of credit as an assurance that the currency is being used according to import country regulations. Pakistan is an example of this. What, what country was an example? Pac Pakistan. Pakistan. Okay. Pakistan. So I'm going to answer that in two different ways. Um, regulations we don't get involved in. So if, if, if you have questions or concerned about import regulations, I would get with the Department of Commerce on that. And, and I'm sure they'll be able to help you. As far as the letter of credit, what that is is money with a bank. So if you're selling a um, million dollars of product and you get a letter of credit from a Pakistan bank, typically you want to do what's called confirming that letter of credit with a U.S. bank. So your money is available in the U.S. and not Pakistan. And when it's confirmed and you have a letter of credit, you you ship the product and you present the shipping documents and then the bank pays you. So a letter of credit is a payment instrument uh, available with a bank as opposed to a purchase order with a company. So if you're getting a purchase order from a corporate entity and they say, I'll pay you 60 days later, 
that's not as reassuring as a letter of credit because a letter of credit is guaranteed money with that bank as long as you meet the documentation requirements. So um, if I understood correctly, when you ship when you ship the product, you get paid on the letter of credit. And if you have import regulation questions or export regulation questions, get with the Department of Commerce. Okay, one more question. How do you t determine U.S. content on services and a product that is not fungible, such as computer software? Very what good question. The, what is Very the policy question. on green technology? Longer terms? Finally, is the XM policy on requiring the product to be, what is the XM policy on requiring the product to be shipped from the U.S.? Yeah, great, great question. Let's start with the service. So product uh -huh. is easy, right? So you look at the cost of your product and where you're buying it from. Um, and typically we stop at the first line of your vendor. So if you're building pumps and you're buying nuts nuts and bolts and little rock little rocks buying from california california is buying from asia we're not going to go that far in the supply chain usually we stop at your first line of vendor in little rock and call that us content so product is easy to to calculate on the service we look at the citizenship of the provider so if you're an american citizen then that's us content if you're a green card holder in the us it's american content if you're a uh, um, engineer in Pakistan, not US content. So we look at the citizenship of the provider as far as uh, services are concerned. What was the other question? I'm sorry. Um, what is the policy on green technologies? Okay, so um, I'm trying to find a concise way to answer that. Um, it depends on the XM product you choose. So if it's insurance, we can be more flexible in a policy offering, and we can go into that detail depending on what you do. So I would say, to, to be concise, re, uh, reach out to me. Let's talk about what you do and where you're selling to, and then I'll be more specific on how we can help you okay. With, okay. with green technology. Yeah. Uh, the, the last part of that question also is finally, uh, is it said still XM policy on requiring the product to be shipped from the U.S. Yes, yes, it is shipped from the U.S., made in the U.S. Perfect. And greater than 50% U.S. content. Yep. Well, very good, uh, Eric. Wonderful presentation. Really great information. Great questions. Uh, we're going to put up the slide for the contact information just in a second here. The technology is always wonderful until it doesn't work, right? Well, I'll tell you what, no no worries. So uh, my my phone number is 501-749-7484. And I'll repeat that, 501-749-7484. Give me a call and I will put you in contact with with uh, the speakers and uh, or anyone else that you need. I, I want to highlight once again that the Arkansas District Export Council uh, is here to help you in almost any way in terms of exporting. Uh, the 35 members of the District Export Council were all appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce. They all have various kinds of experience pertaining to export uh, related uh, items. So we've got lots and lots of, of experience and uh, expertise and knowledge and history pertaining to things that are having to do with export. We're here to help you. Feel free to contact us and we will, uh, if our member, uh, a specific member has the expertise to answer your specific question, we'll put you in contact with them. Uh, if we know that you need, you need to talk to Eric or you need to talk to her, or you need to talk to whomever, uh, then we will put you in contact with them. But do know that we're here to help you and that the Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions Department within Arkansas Economic Development Commission uh, is once again sponsoring this series of webinars to be able to help you be successful exporters. And I guess with that, we will go ahead and call it good.
feel free to co contact us with any questions that you might have afterwards. We will be sending the uh, recording and the, you will have access to the slides for the, today's presentations as well. Do know that tomorrow, same time, nine o'clock standard, we're gonna have the second session of four uh, pertaining to, uh, and it will be um, Mr. Jonathan Bricker with Arvis Bank, and he'll, he'll be talking about loan products as well, and also letters of credit, all of the different kinds of instruments and risk mitigation tools that you can use to make sure that you get paid and things that you need to consider. So we'll see you tomorrow at nine o'clock central time here and uh, look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you everyone.